Well, here it is. TA2962 finally set it down on its own four wheels today. It's been up in the air on stands for probably about five years, which is when I started tearing down the chassis and getting it ready for restoration. So it's come a long way since then. Um, you can see the supercharger cover and, and side valances are not currently attached. We're going to pull the bonnet and all that stuff off of here when we do the test fire next week. Uh, because I want to see if, if it's leaking, make sure I have access to everything so I can look for any problems that might occur. And we expect there will be problems. There always are with these kind of builds. So it won't be surprising and we'll be ready for it. So anyway, for those of you who aren't car people, we'll start at the front here. Uh, this supercharger made by Volumex and it was used on Italian sports cars in the, the 80s and was retrofitted for these vintage MGs because it fits the part and puts out about 8 to 10 PSI of pressure, uh, which helps boost the engine output. So, um, and this thing right here that looks like a wine bottle is a carburetor. So um, that mixes the air and fuel together. So you get air coming in through this filter, fuel comes in through this float and into the carburetor. They get pressurized with the supercharger and then forced up that tube and into the engine. So you get more power for a given engine displacement that way. Move over to the side here. These are friction dampers. So they function as a shock absorber. So when the springs compress on a bump, these slide together and these move as a scissor motion and it's controlled by this pinch bolt here. So you can set the uh, amount of resistance so that you don't bounce up and down going down the road. Got our nice blackly tires on here with our chrome spinners in the middle. Working on the bonnet strap, I've got this little rod that goes down and connects down there. So we just need to fold this back around there and then come back up and sew that and that'll be done. The dual exit exhaust pipes turned out beautifully. Uh, special thanks to uh, Thunfield Rod and Custom. They did a beautiful job on that. Here's the cockpit. Um, the seats aren't quite done. Katie's working on a prototype right now that we can test out using a different kind of leather that's uh, scrap material. So we don't dig into the good stuff in case we make a mistake. Um, we've got the gauges here. We've got low beam, high beam, side and tail light, hazard lights, fuel pump one and two, ignition and bypass. Uh, that bypass is a low oil pressure switch. Um, so if for some reason the switch fails and it shuts off the ignition, we can verify that the oil pressure, which is this guy here, um, is high. If it's still high and adequate, then it means that the, the pressure sensor switch failed and you can put it on bypass and get the car off of the road to do the troubleshooting. So some safety features built in. This guy here is a selector that goes along with his fuel pump switch. So if you've got it on fuel pump one, you select the route for fuel pump one right there, and it will draw from that side of the tank. Uh, the other side serves as a reserve, and you can use either or. Um, you can't use both with the way I've got it pumped, and, and there's really no reason to because these pumps deliver plenty of fuel for this engine. So we've got uh, radiator temperature, oil temperature, supercharger pressure vacuum, oil pressure, tachometer, eight day clock, and a chi gas pump. Chi gas uh, helps prime a cold intake manifold with raw fuel. It has a little jets that squirt in there. So you can unscrew this and then pump it in and out and it will prime raw fuel, which could come from a tank there. It's unlikely I'll ever use it because I have a choke fitted to the carburetor. Oh, there's the turn signal indicator. I put that on there because I didn't want to clutter the dash. And, and those controls, if we look under here, there's a horn and then the turn signal left, right, and off and center. Um, 
pre-selector gearbox. First, second, third, fourth, and then a lockout for reverse because you don't want to find that on accident at 60 miles an hour. Um, there's the gear change pedal on the left. Brake pedal in the center. A little bitty throttle pedal on the right. So that gear change pedal functions a lot like a manual transmission, except in the 30s, a lot of those transmissions didn't have the synchro mesh to allow a smooth gear change. So you'd crunch, crunch, crunch until you found the gear. This particular box uses a series of bands and, and clamps around those bands uh, to engage the gears. So you don't have to worry about synchro mesh on this car. There's our little MG logo on the passenger side footboard. One of the few creature comforts that this car offers. Um, move back here. We've got a safety light here. This provides rear and side visibility with a red LED light. Um, it has both stoplight and running light functions. We've got the Le Mans style filler cap. So in a race, you would want to dump fuel in in a big hurry. So the reason there are two of them, you can access either side. Whichever one's not being used to dump fuel, you open it up because that lets the air out. So you spill a bunch of fuel on your hot exhaust pipes, uh, which could end in a really long, bad day. Here's the exhaust pipes. I'll take you in real close here. Check these out. So Marshall Woolery from Thunfield Rod and Custom was the one that did the manifold and it just came out beautiful. So special thanks to him for making this possible. It's hard to find craftsmanship like that here in the States. Here we've got uh, turn signal and Lucas ST38 tail lights and some little securing tie down brackets just to keep this thing from going anywhere on the trailer. There's the back view. That's my favorite view of this whole car. It reminds me of an ant or a wasp or something with this tapered abdomen section here. Now there is the scratches that happened in storage on the shelf. Um, I know how they happened. Very frustrating, but I have a solution. I've got a touch up kit and I'll make those disappear pretty quick. Uh, there's the license plate. Um, that's a 38 and that's Pierce County. So that was kind of neat. Found that on eBay, sent it up to the license farm somewhere north of Seattle and they restored it for me. And that will be the plate we use. Let's move forward here. Well, we already looked here. Let's take a look at the tail cone. Why don't we flip this thing up, see what's going on under here. So what's nice about this light is when you bring this down, look at that. It's a rubber fixture. Instead of having this thing crash down on the aluminum, destroy itself. So we have a little boot space here and it's a busy area. We're gonna have a, a jack here. We've got the, the hammer there, probably tool roll there, removable platform to stabilize the jack if you're in gravel. There's a battery. Here's an oiler for the chassis lube system. Um, which, since we're right here, let's take you in on this guy. This is part of the chassis loop. So this spring slides in uh, a cylindrical brass trunnion in this tubular section here. And so it rotates with the movement of the spring and the spring slips in and out as it expands during compression. So you need to keep lubrication on that. And that was a problem with this car when I bought it. It was completely worn through. It had worn through the brass and right out the top of this chassis tube. And that would have been a frightful situation when that whole thing dropped down to the ground. So anyway, I rebuilt all of this with new tubes and new trunnions and new springs. And these lines are meant for oil, not grease, even though they look like grease fittings. So anyway, there's, uh, you've seen these shapes before up front. These are mounted inboard because there's not a whole lot of room back here. And that's traditionally where they put these on the back. We've got two fuel pumps with their respective uh, float bowl filters down here, sediment bowl filters. Uh, we have a fire system here that's plumbed in three locations. We've got one back here by the fuel filters. There's a nozzle. We have one in the cockpit and then one on the supercharger out front. So those are the three areas where we're gonna protect the passengers and the two areas where the fuel is concentrated. So. Um, it may not entirely extinguish uh, 12 gallon tanks worth of fuel, but it will buy us time to get away from this thing if we have a really bad day. 
So these are the securing nuts for this. So this hinges down. Just like that. You can wind these up. In order to check fuel, this particular car doesn't have a sending unit. So we've got this dipstick. And the way this works is you dip the tank and then there will be notches on this stick for each gallon of fuel that I add. And that will be calibrated so I know how much is in there. So it's not a bad system. It seems kind of archaic, but in the grand scheme of things, 12 gallons will get you a long way in this car. And if you run out, you've got three gallons on the other half of the horseshoe tank as a reserve. So you can flip over to the other fuel pump and if you drive easy, you could probably get another 60 miles, maybe 70 miles out of it, which is plenty of time to go to a fill-up station. Speaking of filling up, it's highly recommended that you don't use ethanol fuels in these cars. It reacts poorly with the aluminum fuel tanks and just creates a big mushy mess in the fuel system. So all of the racers say don't use ethanol fuel. So there's a place here in Tacoma, I think it's Ball um, Auto Mechanics uh, over by Stadium High School that has that fuel. It's a little bit more expensive, but it's well worth it. So we'll give you more updates pretty soon. You see, I have to write notes to myself. Needs coolant. Lots of things to do still, but uh, should go pretty quick. We're hoping to start this bad boy early next week. So stay tuned.